All right, hello everybody, how are you guys? To the returning attendees, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're very happy to have you. We'll be starting in, in just a minute. Um, last week we discussed media literacy and today we will continue exploring elements of civic readiness as we learn about the importance of engaging in controversial conversations. Your input is valuable, so please feel free to engage with one another in the pan in, with one another and with the panelists in the chat box. And if you do have specific questions for the panelists or the moderator, use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. There you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions um, either with your name or anonymously, whatever you prefer. And if you are directing your questions to someone in particular, please be sure to indicate that when you're sending it in. Um, these sessions will be recorded, so keep an eye out for an email with instructions on how to access these recordings. And finally, at the end of the session, you'll have another opportunity to give input through a survey that will pop up in your browser and it will also be in your emails. Um, I think we've got um, a bunch of people logged on right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and play a short introduction for you guys. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Rubell, the Executive Director of the Center for Educational Equity at Teachers College, Columbia University. And I'd like to welcome you uh, to the series on Mending the Fabric of Democracy, Teaching Civic Readiness. Hundreds of people attended the first session of this four-part webinar series last week. Uh, these people were from all over New York State and actually from all over the country and from some different parts of the world. So we were really pleased at the reception that this webinar series uh, has generated so far. Uh, <clears throat> this is an important topic. The purpose of public education, as articulated by the founders of our country back in the 18th century, was basically to prepare citizens who would be able to maintain the experiment in mass democracy that America had instituted back at that time. Interestingly and importantly, just a few years ago, the Court of Appeals, New York State's highest court, articulated a constitutional right that each child in the state of New York has. And that right resounded back to the insight that the founding fathers had. And that was the insight that uh, the purpose of public education is, as the court said, um, the court in 2003, the purpose of basic purpose of public education is to prepare students with the skills they need to function productively as civic participants capable of voting and serving on a jury. That is the constitutional right today of every student in the state of New York. Now, unfortunately, not all our schools have been doing the job that they should have been doing to make civic education a priority, to make sure that students graduate from our schools uh, with a solid knowledge of civic facts, a solid knowledge of history, the skills they need uh, to become functioning, capable citizens, uh, civic experiences uh, that prepare them for these roles and a real respect for democratic values. Uh, but I think that situation is changing um, we were very pleased uh, a few years ago, 2016, when the regents, the Board of Regents that uh, has uh, executive authority over education in this state, uh, decided to emphasize the importance of civic education by writing into their ESSA plan, the plan they filed with the, with the federal government, um, that uh, the outcome of education in New York State had to emphasize what they called civic readiness. In the past, the purpose of education, the outcome of education, according to the regents, had been preparing students um, for college and careers. But today, 
the stated outcome, the Regents policy is to prepare students for college, career and civic readiness. And then the Regents went one step further. They established a task force to help them develop an understanding of what civic readiness means and to help promote it throughout the state. And that task force has come up with recommendations for a robust definition of civic readiness for a state seal that will reward students with uh, an acknowledgement on their diploma if they've done well in learning about civic issues and acting upon that. And also encouraging all schools throughout the state to uh, offer students capstone projects to bring together their learning and their experience on civic values. Um, what I also want to emphasize is that uh, to follow up on what the region's actions were to help them implement it and expand it, a large number of groups and individuals around the state have come together to form an important coalition, a new coalition called Democracy Ready New York. And this coalition brings together the leading education organizations in our state, the leading civic organizations, civil rights groups, professors, researchers, all of whom are sitting at the table and doing more than sitting, taking action to uh, discuss, uh, to deliberate, and to understand what needs to be done to promote civic education throughout the state of New York and to work together to make that happen. So this webinar series that's being sponsored throughout the uh, month of March is a joint undertaking of our center and of the uh, Democracy Ready New York Coalition. Now, uh, I'd like to ask Shira Epstein to tell you a bit more about this webinar series. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are thrilled to be here with you for the second webinar in our four webinar series on teaching civic readiness. I'm Shira Epstein. I'm a professor and the program director of social studies education at the City College of New York, CUNY. I'm also a proud member of the Democracy Ready New York Coalition here to offer a brief framing of the webinar series. For each Thursday in the month of March, we are working together to gain knowledge about essential components of civic readiness and identify ways we all can advocate for robust and equitably available civic learning opportunities for all New York youth. We began last week with media literacy, a critical topic given widespread dissemination of misinformation and disinformation on civic topics. Today, we focus on how to discuss controversial issues. We will ask, what are the benefits and challenges involved in young people discussing controversial issues? How do they grapple with and aim to truly hear diverse perspectives? And next Thursday, March 18th, we turn to our final key component of civic readiness, taking civic action. After students have developed deep and informed knowledge about civic problems, through media literacy discussion and other knowledge building practices, we want them reaching out to others, striving to make change through action. We are very lucky to be learning about these essential components of a quality civic education from a diverse array of perspectives. We thank our talented panelists for helping us develop an enhanced vision of youth civic readiness. As for all of you, we also hope that you leave each webinar with at least one new idea of what you can do as a parent, teacher, student, youth worker, school administration, nonprofit organizer, researcher, elected leader, and the list goes on. Please draw on the wisdom in these webinars to ask what you can do to make sure that a high quality education prioritizing civic readiness is ensured for all youth. This work is urgent. Democracy is in need of a repair. Our education system has neglected the teaching of civic readiness and today's youth suffer from a lack of meaningful ways to engage with the pressing problems of society. Yet our students have important perspectives. They're ready for supportive entry into civic life and it is their right to receive an education that prepares them for democracy. To this end, we look forward to gathering together once more on March 25th to
to talk with New York leaders about how to make the right to civic readiness a reality. We hope our partnership with you will continue beyond this webinar series. Please go to the Democracy Ready New York website, www.democracyreadyny.org for further information on the various session topics and resources for action. I now hand the mic over to Professor Brett Levy from the University at Albany SUNY, who is a researcher of civic education and host of the podcast, Education for Sustainable Democracy. Professor Levy will be the moderator for today's panel. Hello and welcome everybody. This is a very exciting event. It's a very exciting series of webinars and we are so happy that you all decided to join us. There are hundreds of you and it really feels like at this important moment in history, this is a movement that's building and you're part of it. So thank you and let's keep it going. Um, so today the main focus of the webinar is discussing the benefits and challenges of students exploring and discussing controversial issues in classrooms. And what we can all do to help to overcome those challenges and maximize those benefits. So we have five panelists, two superintendents, two teachers, and one uh, academic. I'm moderating and um, I'm very excited to hear what everybody has to say. So to start off, but before we get into our discussion and before you meet the panelists, we are going to see a short video that features three student voices, Rachel, um, Ed, who are um, secondary school students and an elementary school student named Lennon from the Inquiring Minds Institute. So it's about a four or five minute video. And after that, we will um, meet all the panelists and go into our discussion. This is what democracy looks like. So do you guys feel that you're being taught honestly? And do you feel that you are being taught important historical topics in depth? In some grades, maybe we would talk about it a little bit and then kind of avoid talking about it once we get too deep for certain reasons, but yeah, we will kind of avoid the topic and just go on to regular stuff again. I, I've had that same thing happen to me where a uh, pretty recent example being the insurrection and the conversation kind of became, I guess, uncomfortable to them and they kind of shut it off. Yeah, I noticed that too with a lot of my classes. Actually, a lot of my classes didn't even mention the insurrection. Is I've definitely noticed a lot of teachers avoid the topics of, of BLM protests and the importance of what's happening and, and how history is happening right now. Because last year we would talk about stuff a little bit, but not really. So I didn't even know that this all this stuff was going on. I didn't know about the Black Lives Matter movement, which I recently learned about that started in 2013. I didn't know about any of that until well, a few weeks ago. Did you know that Black Lives Matter protests and every protest that is essential to the roots of Black Lives Matter did not actually start in 2013. It has been going on way before we were born. Oh, wow. <laughs> Do you feel that it's important that we are taught things like this? Yes, very much. I mean, I, I agree with Lennon. I do think that we're not given enough information uh, when it comes to hard topics because I guess they just don't think it's worth it or they think we'll figure it out later. Although an important thing to know is that the only way you can learn something is to become uncomfortable and you can't really teach history without politics. So the avoidance of any type of politic is denying an education in a way. During more controversial uh, recent events, they'll kind of preface it by saying, we're teachers, we can't, we're not allowed to state our political beliefs. So obviously like that's kind of one thing that is preventing us from having these important conversations. Like if they wanna keep their jobs, they can't speak on these things. 
is that something that that we can fix like we can we can fix the stigma around being real with your students like if, if it's ingrained in how the school system is and how it's built if we can help change the rules of where teachers stand because they're human too and they're living in the same world we are i think it's important that we have to be taught the all of the truth if you're not learnt truth no matter work out something if somebody disagrees with you it kind of won't get to you anywhere in life yeah it's kind of like living in a bubble so you guys believe that teachers should bring in respectful conversations into the classroom and to start being open to conversations about difficult and controversial topics because it helps learn the truth about the world you're living in yeah yeah I, the way we kind of learn about these current events now is very surface level where we're kind of only taught the cliff notes of what the current event is if like i'm taught that i cannot have a conversation about uh let's say the black lives matter movement i can't participate in that because i i don't have enough knowledge on it to make a good point yeah that's really important all right thanks to um thanks to rachel ed and lennon for your comments in that video and that thought-provoking video and to dk holland for producing that um so I'd like to start by having all the panelists introduce themselves, and it would be great if you could start by telling us your name, current position, and briefly how you've engaged with this topic of students exploring and discussing controversial, contentious issues in, issues in the classroom. And I'll start with Dr. Kristlyn Dengler. Um, I'll just um, move from my upper left, and I'll mention your names um, in the order in which I see them, which might be different from how you see them. So. Dr. Dangler, please take the floor. Welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, when I thought about this topic, I'm gonna actually tell you why I'm here first. When I thought about this topic, I thought of my own upbringing and the adage of, you don't know, talk about uh, religion and politics and what a disservice that has been to me. And I don't think it, my generation is the only generation, <laughs> obviously we've just heard that from, from students about wanting their teachers to be real with them. I think that's amazing. Um, and so I, I sought to join this conversation to normalize the working through the thinking and the listening that it takes to have a good discourse around these topics. So a little bit about me. Uh, this is my 28th year in education, uh, 12th year as an administrator, second year as a superintendent at a small rural school in upstate New York. And again, I frequently feel like the rural school voice gets left out. So again, I decided to step up and be part of that voice. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Robinson. Um, thank you very much, Brett. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Oliver Robinson. I'm the superintendent of the Shenandoah Central School District, which is a large suburban school district in Saratoga County. We're about 10,000 students. This is my 20th year as a school superintendent. This is my 16th year here at Shenandoah Schools and my 28th year as an administrator in the state of New York. Um, this topic, particularly the topic around democracy, when you think about the times that we're in and the struggles that we're having, um, this topic is, is timely and this topic is vital, particularly for our young people who we often say and tout to be our future leaders for them to not only understand where we want to go or need to go, but also to understand um, from which they came and the rights and privileges that they actually have. So, so when we talk about issues surrounding democracy, we talk about issues surrounding rights, we talk about issues surrounding justice, we talk about issues surrounding fairness. So this is truly the topic of the day. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. Lauren Pillay-Gildard. 
Hi, I'm Lauren Coley Gildard. Um, I've been teaching for 11 years um, at a big school district, Arlington High School in LaGrangeville, New York, which is in the Hudson Valley, about midway between New York City and Albany. And I also teach at, at Bard College in the MAT program there with graduate students um, from different backgrounds. And um, lastly, I'm a doctoral candidate at uh, the State University at Albany, and my research includes controversial issue discussions in social studies classrooms, as well as media literacy. And I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. And Professor Paula McAvoy. Hi everyone, I'm Paula McAvoy. I'm an assistant professor at North Carolina State University here in Raleigh, North Carolina. So it's a pleasure to join you in New York State today. Um, my I was a high school social studies teacher for 10 years in California. Um, and now I'm someone who researches both um, how we can help students better engage in classroom discussions, how do we prepare teachers to engage their students in classroom discussions, and I also uh, write and research um, about the ethical dilemmas that teachers face when they bring politics into the classroom. So I'm excited to join the conversation. Thank you, Paula. Amber Joseph. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I am currently uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm a 12 year veteran of New York City public schools uh, and also a product of them. Um, I'm very fortunate to teach eighth graders um, a whole semester of civics and um, history of the United States. Um, I mean, I don't think I need to say anything differently than what other people have said. Obviously, this work is very timely. Um, pretty much since I have started teaching my course, we've covered um, the election of 2016, Black Lives Matter, the insurrection most recently. So it feels very important to be here. Um, and thank you everyone who is here to listen. Thank you. And I'm Brett Levy. I was a middle school teacher of social studies and English and history in California. And I've been involved in teacher education since 2006. And I'm an associate professor at the University of Albany. My research focuses on civic education. So I'm very excited to be moderating this panel and excited to hear everybody's perspectives. So we are going to start by defining and exploring the key concepts that we're going to be discussing. So my first question, we're going so in our discussion today, we're going to start with some definitions. What exactly are controversial issues? What are exactly our contentious issues? And what are their, um, what are the main benefits and challenges involved? And we'll start with Paula, then we're going to ask Amber and Lauren about their experiences teaching these issues, and some of uh, some some exciting and challenging experiences that they've had share with us. And then we'll ask Chrislyn and Oliver for some administrative perspectives on how to create a culture that supports the discussion of controversial issues in classrooms. And then we'll um, then move to having all panelists discuss how policymakers can support, um, how, how everybody can work to support the discussion of controversial issues in classrooms. And we'll end with Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, you can, um, feel free to direct them to a panelist or to everybody and we'll, we'll address those at the end. So first question goes to um, Paula McAvoy. So Paula, um, you've written the, a book with Diana Hess called The Political Classroom. Um, you've thought about, um, you thought a lot about what defines controversial um, classroom issues and, um, and topics. I'm wondering if you can share some definitions with us that will help lay the groundwork Your microphone is off. Start with the mic. Great. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Brett. As, as I was, Brett was just alluding to, that conversations about controversial issues in the classroom are often get sort of at cross purposes because people map a lot of things onto those terms. And so I just wanted to start with some common understanding of, um, of some ways we could think about these issues. So I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, I'm just going to leave us in the not, you know, in, in the non-presenter mode here. So really quickly, when I think of a controversial issue, I'm thinking of a question that has multiple and competing views, just very simply. There's a lot that could go into, we, we could make this a very complicated definition. I'm going to keep it a very simple definition. Um, or it's a question that invites disagreement. 
So a controversial issue could be, should the United States raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour? A controversial could also, issue could also be, should our school dress code policy be changed? So those are both examples of controversial issues that invite multiple and competing views. And when you introduce a controversial issue into the classroom, you might engage students in deliberation, which is a type of discussion um, that aims to make, to come to a decision about the issue. So we, it, it's an opportunity for kids to share competing views, um, to weigh through evidence and reasons, and perhaps come either to, if not to consensus, at least deepen their understanding and sort of in their minds, make a set, uh, 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 formulate an opinion about what should be done. But you might also debate a controversial issue. And so this is to make a distinction between delay, debate and deliberation, a formal type of discussion in which opposing sides are put forward, are put forward arguments, usually with the aim to win. So this changes the dynamic in the classroom if we're deliberating to decide what to do versus we're de debating to see who will win. So those are two different strategies. Uh, I can throw a teaser out here that I'm currently researching the different effects of deliberation versus debate, but I'm gonna not go into that right now. Um, but we might also think about a different concept, which is a controversial topic. And when people hear controversial issue, they often what they're thinking about are controversial topics. And this is content that could be included in a course that might invite scrutiny from either inside or outside of the classroom. So when the students were talking about, you know, talking about race or Black Lives Matter, teachers want to shy away from it. It's that's content that teachers worry could invite scrutiny if they bring it up in the classroom. And this is usually content that challenges dominant narratives in society. So they def usually touch upon issues of race, gender, sexual identity, religion, ethnicity, but can also be highly polarized issues. So if we were to bring up, should Donald Trump have been impeached a second time, that would also be something that might invite scrutiny um, in certain, in particular classrooms. And when you're talking about controversial topics, it might be that we're just learning about them and engaging um, in research and um, historical study of that topic. But you might also engage students in a dialogue, which is a discussion process that aims to develop mutual understanding about how we differently experience the world, especially those from marginalized groups. So when you diet, when students are in dialogue, they're sharing their experiences. This is, not a, this is not about what should we do question, but this is sort of how do we all experience the world question. And so I lay these out here because it's important to think about the questions that we ask invite different strategies um, and that we just end on them to get clarity between what we mean by issues and what we mean by topics. So I'll just lay that out there um, as a starting point for our discussion. Thank you, Paula. So I'm wondering if you could also tell us about what research says about the benefits of discussing controversial issues in classrooms for students. Sure. Um, so first, the research shows that students hardly ever get to talk in classrooms. <laughs> and so that's an important um, starting point for this discussion, that a lot of what typically happens in social studies classrooms is still primarily uh, lecture, some research, maybe occasional presentation. So I think um, one thing that, that you in this coalition can think about is how do we bring more discussion of various sorts into the classroom. But what research shows is that when my research with Diana Hess shows that uh, students find these highly engaging classrooms. Um, and I should, I should say one other point about the deliberation debate dialogue. These, um, when students come into all of those strategies, is that students are talking to each other. And what often happens in classrooms is when discussion appears to happen, it is students making comments to the teacher. And I think if we could just shift our thinking of how do we get students talking to each other, we're moving into a space um, that is sort of more democratically fruitful because we want students to learn to give reasons um, and evidence and to, to each other. And that's the democratic value of using this strategy in the classroom. So student, when you're able to do that, students are more engaged in the course, they develop more interest in politics, they're more likely to start talking about political issues outside of the classroom, um, they're more likely to start following the news and following uh, topics of the day. So there's all sorts of good that comes from uh, 
uh, you know, it, and basically a discussion is a type of collective inquiry. So it takes, it picks up the very strategies of inquiry um, that deepen learning uh, and make learning more engaging. But you, and you found that many students do not have this opportunity. I'm wondering what you think are some of the reasons for that and also what some of the challenges that students and teachers encounter that might cause that, that lack of discussion in classrooms. When we ask teachers who don't engage students in discussion, what are, what are the reasons that hold them back? It's, it's usually three things. One, I don't feel like I know enough about the issue to bring it up in the classroom. And so they worry they're gonna sort of be out of their area of expertise. Two, they worry that students sort of can't handle it, that there's gonna become a management issue. Um, and three, they worry that they might invite scrutiny so that they might not be, their administrators might not back them up, a parent might complain and they're not gonna know how to handle that. Um, but in my mind, all of those things uh, can be you know, mitigated and we can, if we were better at teaching teachers how to have discussions, what are the strategies to use, how to do facilitation um, and how to get students talking to each other um, that alleviates a lot of the concern. Students can learn how to discuss with each other about political issues if we put the right structures in place in the classroom. And I think this is, um, you know, a lot of times teachers get, um, because they see um, discussion as students talking to, to the teacher, that, um, that changes the dynamic when students are talking to each other. And so we can help students deepen their understanding about the issue and then talk to each other. And that alleviates the teacher's concern that I'm not gonna know what to say. So, mm -hmm. so you mentioned structures. So what are some of the structures that you think could um, help teachers avoid some of these pitfalls that you mentioned when they are concerned that students can't handle these kinds of discussions what type of structures would help in your view and then we can bring we'll, we'll bring in a couple of the teachers that are on the panel to maybe give some examples of that go ahead paula right so i'll just briefly say that so uh what is often misconstrued as as or what i often see as two little structures a teacher who wants to without much preparation of the students throw out a topic and sort of say, what do you think? And imagine this sort of free flowing, loose discussion and that people are just gonna naturally be engaged in that discussion um, versus having students do a reading and a turn and talk. I mean, a turn and talk is a mini structured discussion is a little opportunity to have a structured discussion um, to more elaborate strategies. Like I love the structured academic controversy model. There's Socratic seminars as a way you can have a discussion philosophical chairs. Um, there's any number of strategies that create some norms around the discussion that require students to point back to readings and evidence and that provide uh, structure for how to discuss because there's often rules about when do you get to talk and what sort of talk do you get to make at different points. So um, there's a, you know, I could provide a number of resources. I'll just say one easy one is the cult of pedagogy is a blog that has, it's, if you just Google the big list of discussion strategies on the cult of pedagogy, you'll get like 15 structures right off the bat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, okay. Are there any other resources that you would like to point people to? Um, I use uh, Making Thinking Visible in my, mm -hmm. um, in my methods courses, which are a whole bunch of interesting, interactive discussion niche strategies that you can use with kindergartners and I use them in my doctoral classes at NC State as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to bring in Lauren and Amber. Lauren, as you remember, teaches in the Hudson Valley and Amber teaches in New York City. Um, so what would you, how would you respond to, to Paula's comments about um, structures and how certain kinds of structures might help to alleviate or avoid some of the challenges that so many teachers, um, that, that might keep some teachers from bringing up controversial topics in the classroom and controversial issues in the classroom. Amber, do you wanna start? Um, yeah, uh, hi. So um, I'm really happy actually to follow um, Dr. McAvoy because so much of what she said, I think is really important philosophically to start to think about. 
Um, I can just talk, I can talk about my own personal experience. I can talk about some things that have happened in my classroom. Um, I think if you as a teacher want to create um, the kind of space that is going to be contingent to discussing the kind of rich intellectual environment I think so many of us want, um, you need two things, uh, maybe three. One is like you need to create that strong classroom culture from the jump. Um, you need administrational support. Um, and I think you also need a lot of professional development. Um, and so I, I teach eighth graders. Um, and like I said, I start a semester of civics. So I feel very lucky in that regard. Um, I make it very clear from the beginning uh, that we're gonna be discussing controversial uh, issues. Um, and I love the differentiation between an issue and a topic because I think that's really important. Um, controversy is a vocabulary word. Um, so we debate a lot in my classroom. Um, we take stands. Um, I also make it very clear to students that they can change their mind. Um, because I think, especially for developmentally, you know, anyone who's taught middle school, uh, you know that there's often a lot of binary thinking, like, yes, no, this is fair, this is not fair. And so I really work from the beginning of the year to tell kids that it's okay to change your mind. It's not a sign of weakness. Um, and the way that we do that is through evidence, right? Like presenting so many different kinds of evidence. Um, I'll, I'll say that I don't shy away from presenting myself in the in 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 the work um, in the teaching because I think that actually brings students in to discussion. Um, I do think you have to share a little bit of yourself um, to be to be good at creating the kinds of spaces uh, that we ultimately want to see. So I don't ever start the year with actually that's not true. I have started the year with controversial topics, but it's because I've spent a couple of days like really setting those classroom norms. So as you can imagine, um, those of you who've been teaching as long as I have, the fall of 2016 was pretty contentious. Um, and I, I, I made it very clear that you can disagree with someone in our classroom, but you can't dehumanize them. And I think that that is really important, a distinction to make. Um, you can say that you like this politician or not, not that politician, but that's a very different thing than refusing to use someone's uh, chosen pronouns, you know? So I think making that distinction is really important. I also think I see this in the chat and this is a huge question in one's everyday life, especially when now we're teaching on Zoom. Um, I say that, you know, we, we're, we're, we're going to disagree with each other, that's okay. Um, but how we disagree is, is far more interesting to me um, than what we disagree about most of the time. Um, you know, I saw Black Lives Matter coming up a lot in the chat. Uh, I, I, I've spent a lot of time talking about that. Um, this semester, I created a project to talk about policing. Um, and that was very important because of the summer in New York City, like everywhere else. Um, there were lots of things that were going on from June onward. Um, I had students sharing videos with me and like emailing me over the summer to ask me what was going on. So I thought it was really important to address that. Um, and we started talking a lot about policing and then ultimately our final project was, you know, whether what what defund the police means and if that's um, something that we agree about. And so I say all that to say that obviously that's something that in some places would be controversial, but because we had built those classroom cultures because I had told students that we're going to be discussing some some real stuff by the end of the semester, they were able to do that. Um, the last thing I'll say is just, I, I, I just think that you kind of have to own what you're doing. Um, you have to make it clear why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and, and you'll be surprised at how students buy into that and by extension, families buy into it too. So that's all I'll say to start. Thank you, Amber. Um, I, I do want to follow up and there's some comments about this issue also. Yay to strong classroom culture and solid communication guidelines. Um, uh, so I, I want to go back to that classroom culture, classroom norms point that you were making. How do you do that you know, from the beginning? Um, what are some you know, specific things that you do to make it comfortable for people to disagree and to change their minds potentially and to listen to each other thoughtfully? Um, I mean, it's like it is the basic stuff you learn in like teacher preparation. I mean, that stuff is really important, like setting, setting the tone on the first day. Um, presenting like four or five norms, 
Um, one of the big norms I actually think it's really important to hone in on from the beginning is the fact that it's one person speaking at a time. Um, and it's simple, but it's really effective because the last thing you want is students shouting over each other because then things get heated, things get emotional, and then sometimes people will say things that then you have to manage that cause um, a lot of problems in your community. So I think as much as possible, like just having simple things, like we don't talk over each other, um, kids, kids can get behind that. Okay, thanks. Lauren, um, what would you say about creating classroom cultures that help to avoid um, tension getting overly heated and um, enabling students to, to handle these types of, of controversies that have been raised? Um, well, just to kind of echo some of what Amber is saying, um, you know, there's a difference between day one and sort of like one month in, two month in, two months in, three months in, and so on. So I have to say that um, there's a lot of prep work that I do. So I'm in, in the, the high school. So I teach ninth and 10th grade normally. This year, I'm only teaching ninth grade. Um, and so with issues that come up early on in the year, rather than have like a full on debate or a full classroom discussion around a particularly heated topic, we might do sort of like a research writing assignment where students are kind of building the skills that they would then be able to use and translate into a classroom discussion with their peers. So um, they're building those skills and at the same time forming that relationship and the, the culture in my classroom, I think what I try to really communicate from day one is that I'm here for you, right? And, and I respect you as an individual. Um, I wanna support you. And so I think that having that stance very clearly, you know, spoken out loud to my students, I think they start to develop respect for me, respect for each other and respect for the space that we are trying to cultivate. Um, but as I said, in the beginning, assignments that are around these controversial issues um, might be more research based. And so I've done things where students might state their opinion on something, you know, the, th the opinion that they come into the classroom with. And then I might assign different readings that provide different viewpoints and they track their thinking along the way. Um, and then maybe once they've done that and they've explored these different sides and maybe, and they've reflected on their own stance and also maybe shifted it, then we might have a deliberation in the classroom at that point. Um, but as things crop up, like the insurrection and so on, I have to say that, you know, we definitely spoke about it. Um, we looked at what we knew about it as things sort of unfolded, but it's been very difficult this year. I have to also add, you know, being online. And that's something that makes this conversation right now very different than a conversation that we might have had oops, <laughs> like a year and a half ago. Um, so that's been really tough. And I know it's on, on the minds of a lot of educators right now. We have families that are listening in and it's nothing that we would hide. Um, you know, there's nothing that I say in my classroom that I wouldn't say in front of parents, but just to be open and honest about where we're coming from and that we wanna support students thinking um, as individuals and making informed decisions about different topics and, and really coming to a place where they can they can own their opinions and not just come in with whatever they've heard from their friends or their family or TikTok for that matter, which is a conversation I had the other day. Um, so did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, you, you alluded early on to the idea of relationship building and making sure students know that you are there to support them and that essentially your goal is their learning and their development. And Amber, you, you referred to some things related to that as well. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about that and if you think, you know, the role you think that plays in facilitating honest, productive, thoughtful exchanges among students and with you. Um, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can, I can go um, just quickly. I, I love, I love what, I love, I love that Lauren started actually by talking about relationships because I think as teachers, we know that's so important, but particularly when we're doing this work. Um, I think in the physical classroom, when I had one, what I had on the walls was helpful for that. Um, I, I, you know, I had, I, I like to make my classroom um, inclusive in that they're pictures of people of color, of women. Um, you know, I, I have, 
a, a stonewall poster. Like I try to be very strategic about what's even on my, my walls. Um, now in the Zoom space, it really is like, like starting the year with a survey. Like, I want you to tell me something about, like some things about you. Um, tell me if you hate history. That's important for me to know. Um, and, and kids will be honest. I have always found that to be the case. If you give them the space and they feel like you will take them seriously, kids will say, I hate history. So if I know that, I, it hurts It hurts my soul because I love it. But mm -hmm. if I know that, then I know that I need to spend some extra time with that person so that we're, we're gonna have to have a relationship, right? You're gonna get through this class and maybe learn and enjoy it, hopefully, because I, I spent some time building a relationship. Maybe I don't have to spend as much time on that kind of relationship building if a kid is telling me that like they're watching all these political TikTok videos, because I ask about that too. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just taking time to like say like, hey, this is your first day with me. Tell me some things about you. Maybe they're related to what I'm about to teach you, but most of the time it's not. And then we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Lauren, did you want to add something? Sure. Um, another sort of like strategy that I think is sort of basic. Um, in a lot of my assignments, I try to give students choices. Um, and when they choose something, they have to talk about why they chose it. So not only their choice, you know, their choice is telling, but then to also explain why they, they gravitated towards a particular thing tells you a lot about your students in it. And it helps to build those relationships so that you really get to know what interests them and, and, um, and who they are. And I think they also feel seen in those moments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So in a couple minutes, we're going to turn to the administrators, but I'd love to get hear, hear a story or two that each of you might have about how you managed a challenging topic, a controversial topic in your classroom and how it either went really well or how you navigated some unexpected challenges that came up. So Amber, do you have one? Lauren, can you actually start? <laughs> okay, Lauren, go ahead. I'm going to start with a failure. And then maybe, Amber, you can end on a positive note. <laughs> so um, just this year, it came up. And again, as, as you now kind of see what's important to me as a teacher, um, I had a moment in my virtual classroom, you know, my remote classroom, where uh, someone signed into a quiz game with, a ex with an extremely racist, offensive, threatening name. And I don't know if it was one of my students or one of their friends or someone else. I, I don't know. Um, it was traumatizing and I was stopped sort of dead in my tracks, right? And I, I ended up ending the meeting. And by the end of the day, I had drafted an email to all of the families. And I told the parents what had happened and I sent the email to the kids as well. And I asked them, you know, to please talk to their students, to please talk to their kids, to ask them what they had seen and to have a discussion about it. And so that's how I handled that. And it wasn't satisfying to me because I would have liked to, if we had been in a classroom where I knew these students, we could sit down together and talk about why these names, why these terms are just so hurtful and harmful and traumatic to people who see them. But we didn't get to do that. And that is something that I'm really, um, I'm sad about this year. And in this case, I sort of, I put it on the families to have the conversation at home um, rather than being able to deal with it in my virtual classroom. So that's one thing where I haven't figured that out yet. I just didn't know them well enough. Because of the virtual setting, it just, it, it seemed too sensitive to you to address in that way. And just, I didn't have, uh, you know, I, I look at blank screens. I don't see, I don't even see the students, you know, so this has been really, really difficult. So with that mm -hmm. barrier, how do you launch into um, such an important and deep conversation with students that I, I don't, a lot of them, I don't feel like I know. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. that made it really hard. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Lauren, I know you also had a success story that you mentioned when we spoke earlier it's on my podcast about um, a student uh, related to teaching about the Capitol riot, correct? 
Yes, that's Did true. Can I share that one? Okay. Yeah, I can, I can <laughs> instead of being so sad. Um, so yeah, we did talk about the insurrection. Um, we looked at things as they unfolded. Students had a lot of feelings about it as soon as it happened. Some people were more informed than others. Um, and we tried to kind of get through that. And what ended up happening, which I think was like one little high point for me was a student had hung back after the uh, Google Meet had shut down and said, I wanted to ask ask you a question. I said, sure. Now I don't, I can't see the student. I've heard his voice before. I've seen his work and that's the extent to which I know him. Um, but what he said was, you know, um, I don't understand the comparison or why the Black Lives Matter protests and riots are any different than what happened at the Capitol. And that was a really, it was a really heavy question that I know peers of his were also grappling with, like, why is this different? And I knew some of them were feeling that way. And there are so many reasons why it's different, right? That we could take many, many hours to discuss. Um, but we got to unpack it at least in like the five minutes that he had between the periods. And what I felt so great about was the fact that he felt comfortable enough to ask me. So even though I have my own opinions on things and some of those opinions are very clear. And as Amber said, you know, we are people and we have, we show ourselves and that's being authentic and forming real connections. So I think that he felt safe enough and the idea that he would not be judged asking me these questions that felt really good just that he felt comfortable enough to ask me so <laughs> thanks lauren um and amber um you have a story or two to share about um managing tension that will bring it to life a bit or yeah, no you, you think, think of one <laughs> i think I'll, i i i just want to go with the success because i okay. unfortunately i do and, and lauren thanks so much for sharing the, the the first like zoom story because i cannot emphasize enough how challenging it is to teach in in a zoom virtual google meets environment whatever platform you're using but i also can't emphasize enough how how difficult it is to be doing like the kind of critical discussion building that we're here to talk about in this space. It's so hard because so much of it is body language and tone and facial expression and just having students be able to leave a room. Um, you know, sometimes like I tell kids, I'm like, if you feel like you need to step outside <laughs> because something is going on in the space, please do so. That's much more challenging to do in this space. Um, but to, to do it, to, to, to move to a successful story, um, I, I recently had a, a, a Zoom chat with a student of mine. He is now a ninth grader and um, he he's really fired up about politics. He has like a YouTube channel, a whole thing. And he had emailed me after January 6th and he was like, we need to talk. When are you free? Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. <laughs> so we made a time to talk and it was obviously so nice to see him. Um, but something he said in the course of a very long conversation where he was kind of unpacking it with me and like all kinds of things was that he said, you know, to me, he said, you know, I never felt like you forced your opinion on us, which I thought was like really something because I was like, really? Because sometimes I'm often like, well, how did I handle that? Like I'm asking all these questions all the time. But he said, you know, I never felt like you forced your opinion on us because you always created space for people to disagree and you always gave us lots of sources. <laughs> so um, the reason why I tell that story is because I think like we're often like, well, how do we make sure they know what they're talking about? It's honestly like sources, <laughs> like kids will complain if you give them a packet, <laughs> but at the end of the day, like they'll go in there and, and look for, for, for sources that will fit the viewpoints they have. And I think that's such a valuable real world skill um, that that was just like really tickled me to have that conversation with him. Thank you so much, uh, Amber and Lauren. Great to hear your perspectives. And you'll, um, we're, I'm gonna turn to the administrators now and um, then we'll join it, get together as a full panel in about 10 minutes or so. So um, uh, Dr. Chrislyn Dengler and Dr. Oliver Robinson, thanks for uh, coming back on. And my question for you is, um, how do you think about managing parents and community members' potential concerns about controversial issues being raised in classrooms? Do you have policies about this? Um, how, do you, how do you manage that challenge? 
Well, this is always a dance, right? I mean, there's no one right answer because there can be something that's, you know, slightly changes each time. But what I can say first, I need to situate myself because when I introduced myself, I didn't say where I was from. I am currently superintendent at South Portright Central School. We have less than 400 students, pre-K through 12. And I have a department of two social studies teachers and two English teachers. And so the guidelines, the, the great thing is we talk on a daily basis, like, and I am walking in and out of their classrooms. Um, I'm very frequently aware of any time that a controversial issue might come up. Um, and we've talked a lot about setting guidelines. So while we don't have a specific policy, um, some of the guidelines we've set up together is to create an active listening um, curriculum. They need to teach the students how to be good active listeners, what that really means. And I think Amber brought up the fact that that includes no interrupting. That's a really important piece, right? Um, and that we talk about issues, not people. So even though I might say something that offends you or is different from what you're thinking, it's not about me, the person, it's about some of the things we're talking about, right? The, the issue. Um, and really trying to help support them when they kind of see there could be this rough water coming ahead, um, help them think around the corners on it and you know put my hat on for what I might hear at a board meeting or what a parent might say to me when I see them in the grocery store, things like that. So help them think around those corners without telling them what to do. Um, and sometimes they ask me my opinion. I had a social studies certification at one point, so it's kind of it's great fun. Um, but I, I frequently just talk about um, the commitment of learning. Um, and so when we create this contract or guidelines for that commitment of learning for the students, um, some of the uh, assessment pieces are really important there. So the teacher might have an assessment portion that says, what are two things you learned by listening that you didn't know before? Wow. What are two questions you now have as a result of that? I mean, those are completely open-ended that you can use in any topic and any issue. Um, and those are just really great ways to get kids thinking and they have to listen because mm -hmm. those are not related to what they already think they know about the topic or the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really sets the expectation that listening is a high priority. And then if they are not able to answer those questions well, then they'll know that they'll have face those questions again the next time and they'll you know, be incentivized to become better listeners and the cycle will continue and they'll become better and better listeners over time. I really like that idea, um, prioritizing active listening. Um, Dr. Robinson, how do you think about managing um, commun possible community concerns about raising controversial issues in classrooms? So from my vantage point, Brett, as superintendent of schools, um, the policy, the board policy is critical because the board policy sets the expectations, it's forward facing, it establishes the parameters, if you will, that supports the, the narrative of the, of the district in terms of what do we stand for as a school district? And also what do we, what, what will we not fall for as a school district? So in other words, it's about ensuring that individuals who work for the organization realize that we wanna take an active and very intentional perspective on issues. And, and so when we think about board policy, either, even policy that communicate to the community, that we're okay with controversial issues being discussed and dissected in the classroom if done in a responsible and a balanced way. Um, so for instance, we have a policy that's um, employee political and civic engagement. And the language of that policy speaks to um, employees not using their office or classrooms and schools, so on and so forth to express their own personal political views and beliefs. However, teachers are encouraged to address issues of current events of instructional and informative value to students. And I think that's where you come back to when you think about what's our role as educators and what's the purpose of school is to provide the instructional and in, in, informational value to our students. And so we even have policies that talks about um, objection, um, obje how do people object to, to curriculum materials and topics? So if a, if a parent says, I don't want my kid reading a particular book or, so we have a policy that speaks to that. And the reason why I keep stressing the policy because we don't want teachers to feel as if they have to handle those issues on their own. This is a systems perspective that says, what, again, what we value as a system. And so when we think about issues of civic education, 
um, when we have those conversations and when we encourage those conversations to be relevant, to be interactive, to foster and facilitate real life civic engagement in our students, to talk about things such as voting, um, such as having firm advocacy positions, such as expressing viewpoint differences on matters of social justice. Those things can be done in an instructional and in, in an informational way. And we also have to recognize that we have, we have to be very careful because there's so many ways that, that, that words are trivialized and politicized and concepts are, 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 are warped in different ways that, that as, as educators, um, we, we have to kind of stay, take that step back and, and really think about what's the message, what's the point that we want to address. And we also know that there's certain topics that are, the minute you bring it up, issues of race or racism, discrimination or, or social justice, those topics, for example, people have a tendency to want to whitewash them versus acknowledging directly addressing those issues head on. So, so we encourage people to, to, to subsequently then engage in deliberate conversations um, without um, eroding to those polarizing debates um, that's often underpinned by personal opinions. We, we encourage people to look at the merit of the issue, to be objective um, and not and, and avoid bias, personal perspective. And we also encourage people to be mindful of the two sides of the proverbial coin, that the speaker and the listener may have completely different perspectives. And so consequently, when we engage in these type of dialogues, it's about how do we interrogate each other's thinking um, as a part of a growth and a learning experience. Um, and so, so with all that being said, we also know that the problem that we run into when we talk about controversial issue is that oftentimes the public, large public, doesn't know enough facts to judge the debate. People bring opinion and state opinion as if it's a fact, when it's re re reality, it's just that, their opinion. So, so we have to then avoid the, the whole situation of, of what's debate, debate versus dialogue, because debate is where opinions come into place. Dialogue is when we start looking for meaning, looking for shared understanding to add to that, 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 that pool of shared values. And so those are some of the things that's, that's important because as educators, as school systems, um, we are, we are, we are um, leaders for learning. We are, we are agents of change. And, and so therefore we must focus on, 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 yes, we want to develop critical thinking in our, skill, in, our, in our students. And we want to develop those critical thinking skills that can cut across all curricular areas. We want to, to ensure that students feel empowered, that there's a sense of voice, a choice. So we want to have those type of, of conversations um, within our classrooms. We want to have students have a sense of self-direction, a sense of agency. So we want to promote that those things come from having conversations about topics that, that people may, some call controversial, some call uncomfortable, but these are all new learning experiences that can take place if we have the right venue to do so. And if teachers know that they're equipped to effectively do so. So, so therefore, when we think about how we evaluate teachers, for example, through our Danielson rubric, those, those things speak to those ex expectations that, that teachers are trying to empower students. And also we think about our professional development to ensure that people are equipped with the right vocabulary to engage in those conversations because it's important for it to occur. And because it's important for it to occur, we therefore must support our teachers, our building level administrators to have those conversations and going back to the policy. And we must also communicate directly to our community that we mm -hmm. expect that we will have these conversations within our classrooms. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great that you have those board policies to, to support you. Um, and I wonder if either of you has a story that you'd like to share about how you navigated a challenge with the, with the community related to controversial issues being explored in classrooms. So I would share that um, we had uh, an English teacher share a, a school shooting article and it was written by um, a student that was involved in a school shooting. And actually the purpose was for them to look for language that was emotional rather than maybe just factual, you know? And so it was separating out how to look at the, the issue versus someone's opinion or feelings about it and how emotion, um, you know, works to persuade, et cetera. And um, the teacher did not get finished with the lesson because there was a lot of discussion and so immediately I heard, um, I was the principal at the time, I'm superintendent at the same building. Um, and 
the the comment was, why are we doing this? You know, it's a very we're uh, Delaware County. We have lots of hunters, and you know, why are we talking about gun control? That really was not um, the point, and it was just interesting to listen because I was able to you know validate their listening and their concern. But then I said, well, actually, I'm aware of what they're doing, and I shared the the actual handout that the teacher gave them, and I always liken it to. And then we ended up talking about it. At a, subsequent board meeting. And I liken it to the fact that we're sitting around a, a basketball game and the ref makes a call. 50% of the crowd is hooray and 50% is booing. We've seen the same exact thing. It's about that perspective taking uh, a lot of times and just understanding that there's there's another side. And, and it's what Oliver said that the other side of the coin perhaps, um, but that other view and that there's more to the story. And so uh, listening first, I've always found is important, of course, as an administrator, but then um, because I'm able, I do know, and I am able to check or check and get back. And we have that um, trust factor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Robinson, do you have a, an anecdote to share about how you managed a controversial issue? You mentioned one the other day, but maybe you have another. Uh, I'm sure, Brett, I'm not sure if I'm a magnet for controversy. <laughs> Uh, after 20 years as a uh, school superintendent, you have your share of those issues. Um, however, with that being said, let me put this in context. I, I think that as a leader, when we are faced with these issues, we have to ask ourselves, are we gonna be on the right side of history when we look back on, on the decisions that we make as, as, as leaders? And, and so, so I, I, when you said the three uh, major issues, when I say major, these things became national wide news issue, Fox News, you name all the national news were, were paying attention to these things. Um, and the one I'm gonna, we had from the from student walkouts against gun violence to, to when we passed policies to support transgender student rights, uh, major, major issues to, to the one that, that I wanna share here because it was kind of interesting. Um, we have a, a growing uh, increase in diversity of students um, and several years back, we a uh, population of our Muslim students, you know, they, they have their rich, their religious, um, 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 religious rituals, so to speak, so to speak, that they go through. And they wanted a, a, a quiet place to, to go and pray at certain points during the school day. And, and this came to my attention from the high school principal. I said, like, absolutely, absolutely, we should do it. Um, we, and, and we did it and it was happening. And ironically, um, someone um, um, of the Christian faith called a media, I'm gonna put a religious faith in there for a second because it makes sense, called a media and all of a sudden this thing became a media storm overnight about how our school districts are harboring Muslim and every horrible things that you could think people would say. And, and from my perspective, it wasn't even a hard decision because when you think about our school systems, we have our school calendar that, that provides Jewish holidays. We have um, time in school where, where students can go and for confirmation studies, leave school earlier or come to school late. We have, and so now I had to put that in perspective to, to our wider population to say, okay, what are you saying to me that, 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 that what's good for the goose is not good for the gander here? So because here's the deal, if we're not gonna do it for, ha have opportunities for all, we're not gonna do it for any. And all of a sudden you started seeing a conversation started backpedaling because people realized that their position was so steeped in their biases. Mm -hmm. And quite frank with you in large part, some of their bigotry. And so, so this, this issue went from um, what they call the Muslim prayer room was what the big headline was. Went from that for us now having a conversation as a community in terms of where, where do we really stand in terms of the differences and especially a community that's changing. So for me, it became a, a huge community op opportunity, a teachable moment for our community. So we went from an issue that yes, was, was hot button, um, death threats, I received them, you name it. But wow. those things to me were absolutely irrelevant because it went to a larger lesson that we as a school community, we as a community as, as a whole had to embrace. And now I'll, I'll tell you because of that, our school environments are, are much more inclusive, much more embracing, because people realize that as a system, we will stand up for the unique differences of all our students. And so, so, so that kind of cuts through a lot of the stories. 
be it issues around transgender, we passed those policies and we had people coming out of the woodwork for all different reasons to protest. And I kept going to that one simple premise, parents send their children to us with blind faith that we're going to do what's in their best interest. And every child deserves that in our system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we've heard from um, the academic perspective, the uh, teacher perspective, and the administrative perspective. It's great to hear all your perspectives. Now I'd like to bring everybody back together for a lightning round before we move to our Q&A. So um, Paula, Amber, Lauren, if you could join us, that would be great. And here's a question that I'd um, like, um, like your thoughts on. Um, and we're going to try to keep this to five minutes so we have time to take questions from um, the hundreds of people who are out there. So um, we have a very diverse audience today, students, parents, educators, school officials, school board members, advocates, policymakers, funders, um, hundreds of you out there. Thank you again for joining us. Um, so what actions do you think that different stakeholders can take to bring more exploration and discussion of controversial issues into classrooms so that all students throughout the state of New York and perhaps beyond can have opportunities to learn through the exploration and discussion of controversial political issues. So I'm gonna start with Amber and Lauren and ask you to think about, uh, to comment on what you think youth and teachers can do. So um, Amber, would you like to start or Lauren, either one of you? Um, and we're gonna try to do this, just try to make it, um, keep it within a minute or so, so that we can get to, um, we're gonna also ask about parents and administrators and teacher educators and universities. So first we'll start with what can youth and teachers do? Um, go ahead, Amber. Um, so obviously the youth are so important. Um, you know, I, we, I don't think any of us would have jobs if it weren't for them. Um, so the first thing that young people can do is, is ask questions. Um, I, I know it's a cliche, but I really do feel that it's very hard to come up with a stupid question. Um, unless, you know, there's a facetious question, but it's very hard to come up with a, a question that truly has no merit. Um, and so I think some of the richest conversations that have happened in my classroom is when someone asks what is a, is a basic question. And because the word basic is now in, you know, parlance um, as a colloquial term, I, I just say like, you know, basic questions are good questions, you know, like there's no such thing as something that's so basic. Um, and I've had so it, it, it's just illuminating to the kinds of questions kids will ask, like when you open up the space that like there's no such thing as a bad question, because we've we've just learned so much from each other. It's like, like if the question, if we're discussing um, the reconstruction, which is such a complex um, unit of study, if the question is, well, you know, what really like what makes someone free that is that is in some ways the question so i think for, for young people asking questions is so important that's one and then two like sharing what you already know like sharing resources i love when students send me tiktok videos um I, I love when they share what they're being exposed to. It's informative for me, but it also helps me to see that they're engaging with these things, even if like maybe their camera's always off in my Zoom class. Um, so that's one. And then two for teachers, I, I said professional development all the way at the beginning. I think it's just so important to seek out PD opportunities, um, especially in the virtual world. Like I have to give a huge shout out to Facing History and Ourselves because mm -hmm. um, they have tremendous tremendous resources, but the thing I also love that they've done is they have in-person resources and then they have the same lesson how to do it virtually. So that's obviously very important right now. Um, mm -hmm. so, so looking for PD is, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Lauren, um, what do you think that youth and teachers can do to support exploring and um, discussing controversial public issues in classrooms? Um, just to echo some of the things that Amber said, you know, students out there that are listening, ask your teachers, you know, ask them questions. Not only is it going to hopefully enlighten you and, and give you a new perspective on something um, or deepen your understanding of something that you've already started to explore, but it also gives your teacher a sense of what you're interested in. And I guarantee it'll pay you back and they'll say, oh, that's right. So-and-so was interested in this topic. Let me try to incorporate that into future lessons. So I promise it will pay off. Um, and then secondly, for teachers, 
professional development, obviously, if you don't see those opportunities um, presenting themselves, you can also look around you. I mean, if you're in a larger district, I guarantee there are some people that are already having these discussions in a successful way. Ask them, lean on them, and also look to them as examples. If you, if you can see that a teacher can have a tough conversation and come out alive, um, then you can do it too. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Um, so for Chrislyn and Oliver, um, what do you think parents, administrators, and policymakers can do to expand students' access to exploring and discussing controversial public issues in classrooms? Well, certainly for parents, um, administrators, and school board members, it is um, creating some norms for having those discussions. And, you know, um, Oliver's school and my school are pretty different as far as um, where we are as far as policy and things like that. And so um, as the stakeholders of the children here, being able to collaboratively set some norms about how we have those safe discussions and all understanding from the get-go that it will be multifaceted. It isn't just one opinion or the teacher's opinion and, and so on and so forth. So I think like all having an understanding so that we can trust the conversations to happen. Uh, because they're just so important. I think that's a huge one. And uh, for policymakers, it is supporting um, opportunities for PD. It is supporting uh, strong resources that are available to all schools, not just schools that can afford it. All right, thank you so much. So, Dr. Robinson, uh, yeah. Uh, Brett, I, I, what I see it is that education is truly the antidote to so many of societal ills. And that's why civics education is so powerful and so necessary. And that's why it's important for us to talk about interrogating our own thinking and assessing our biases before we engage in this, this important work. That's why it talks about the importance of empowering students, listening to their voices. It's important to have objective structures, processes in place so, so those things can happen, so we can stay in dialogue and not in debate. So there's a free flow of meaning and new understanding as a result of these engagements the two um, ladies spoke about before as, as classroom teachers. That's why it's so important that, that we avoid the pitfalls, that we ask questions to gather information and stimulate thought and discourse and avoid overreaching. And I think that often that times happen where people assume that they're the only person that, that because they have an opinion, their opinion is the most important. And that's why it's also important that we, we, we are very cognitive or we should be very cognitive of, of our inherent biases and recognize that, that every opportunity that we have or every engagement should be a teachable moment, not only for students, but also for the adults. And I think sometimes we forget that. All right, thank you, thank you. And Paula, what do you think that teacher educators and universities can do to support more exploration and discussion of controversial issues in classrooms? I think um, first and foremost is that they should teach discussion as an essential skill for all social studies teachers. And they should, um, to that end, ex make sure that a social studies teacher understand what a discussion is, that they should leave your program with a set of strategies that they know how to use in the classroom. They should have experienced those classrooms at the university or those strategies in the university classroom, practice them in the university classroom. And then I've gotten that now we require them in student teaching that you have to try out some of these strategies when your university supervisor is there. Because what often happens is uh, you go into the cooperating teacher's classroom and the cooperating teacher is not doing what these two teachers <laughs> have been modeling for us. They didn't set up the right climate. They, they don't use discussion. And then the student teacher feels like, well, I shouldn't do it now. Um, and now if, if you have to say to your cooperating teacher, my university is requiring me to use these strategies, you have to let me try them. Um, that just gives them a little bit more backup um, to say to the cooperating teacher, you've got to open up enough space for this teacher to, uh, to try these things out and learn them. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, so we have two questions from the audience and I hope we can get to both and there may be more. I think there are a lot of questions that have come in, but this comes from Jonathan from Ithaca. His question is this, I'm curious about how to handle heated moments when voices begin to rise and intense emotions start to come out. We have great debates and discussions in my classes, but sometimes it winds up being five similar opinions ganging up on a single differing opinion. How can that best be handled? 
Lauren, I see you. Sure, okay. I'll just speak to this um, for a minute. Uh, one thing that I didn't share is that my district is very large and completely split down the middle, like 50-50 between the two sides of the political spectrum. Um, so things definitely get very heated um, with regards to student students' opinions. And so if things start to get sort of off the rails and we're getting away from the issues and we're starting to make like personal attacks, I do, for me, I tend to draw the attention back to myself um, and then also to what they're actually talking about. So laying it out. Okay, so what are we discussing here? Um, what are the definitions that you're using? How do you understand this particular issue? And so looking at that instead of looking at each other as, um, people on, on an opposing side, I think that tends to kind of simmer some of those uh, more heated conversations. Mm -hmm. I think protocols are also useful for that. Um, I, you can make all kinds of protocols. One um, I've had for like a mock Congress is that, you know, one person speaking at a time, but also like no more than two people at a time can like co-sign an opinion. Um, so there's that. There's also like, you can do like body language things. Like I know some teachers have this where it's like students can agree and then they just like in a, in a non-verbal cue sort of way, just signal their agreement. Sometimes that diminishes the, the heat because you're not actually arguing um, in, a, in a verbal way. All right, thanks. I, I, okay, go, go ahead, Paula. I was just gonna say that there's different the discussion strategies like the structured academic controversy I mentioned earlier is uh, there's several strategies like that that actually slow down students thinking so that they move. It's not tell me your opinion first. It's let's, step, let's, engage, let's read the reading first. Let's share what's in the readings. Let's make sure we understand uh, and you're using talk all along the way. And the last thing you do is say your opinion on the issue. And I think that's a, on particularly heated ones. Let's not rush to judgment. Let's make sure we've already heard all the perspectives before we uh, engage in the discussion. Yeah, that's a really great strategy that requires students to engage with, with at least two sides of an issue, uh, structured academic controversy. Um, and there's a, there are several models of it that you can read on the web about that. Um, so Jillian is an, a high school instructional coach in Westchester. She asks, how can I impress upon science and math colleagues that these conversations and spaces are necessary in their classrooms as well and should not live in the humanities only? Any uh, thoughts right, there? Right, I just want to chime in because I said it before. I, I think when you think about this, this is about teaching kids how to develop critical thinking. How, and, and that cuts across all content areas. And, and, and so that's a skill that doesn't matter if it's social studies. And I think that's, I'm glad the person asked that question because sometimes people think that the only time these issues should take place is within a social studies classroom. However, oftentimes when you have those conversations outside of that setting, it has a different flavor to it because uh, that you showed now, it's, no about, it's, it's not about a debate, my opinion versus your opinion, it's about how this matter. And I'll give you a perfect example. Our teachers sort of having conversation around political policy and science, and they got into things such as global warming, got into things about experimentation. And so all of a sudden kids got a political topic that's now brought in too truly into a scientific environment, if you will, and it changed the whole complexion of the discussion. So, so I, I think this is one of those things when we think about what's our purpose as a school system, our purpose at the end of the day is to, to have learners who are critical thinkers, um, learners who can who can um, differentiate between fact and fiction, people who are who are also can draw inferences and conclusions. Those things cut across all content areas. Thank you. Um, some really great questions here. Um, this one's directed to the teachers. Um, you both mentioned how committed you have to be to do this work. Do you find it challenging to collaborate on controversial issues with colleagues? Have you experienced any pushback or retaliation from peers? Um, well, I have to say, I, I really value my administration and the support that I have in my department. Um, the, the head of my department is incredible, and I'm surrounded by a lot of really brilliant colleagues, some of which are out there. Um, but I do have a co-teacher as well, and he comes from a different perspective. And I've sort of taken him along for the ride and really 
you know, I think made a convincing argument. So I've brought him along with me, but I know that I have other colleagues that I have these conversations with and they still, they still shy away um, from these topics for all of the reasons that Paula mentioned. And um, so hopefully in time, and I have to say that I think that there's been a shift since the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten more mainstream attention. I think that there has been a cultural shift in my district pushing for you know um people to be more actively engaging with students in these conversations so i think i think a lot is happening with that yeah i'll chime in i i'm i'm very lucky my school is um incredibly supportive in so many ways and you know our, our history and ela teachers are just amazing um but to go to the earlier question science and math too like they have an understanding of the importance of like discussion in their classrooms um i i i really I lost my train of thought. Um, I, I I think if you find that there's resistance in your department, inviting colleagues to come see a lesson is really powerful. Um, and, and not necessarily front loading it with like, look, I'm gonna discuss gun control today, but say like, you know, here are some things I'm gonna do in my classroom. I'd love to hear what you think. Um, and 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 that that fosters collegiality too. Um, and also just brings more eyes into your space. Like here what the thank kids are saying. Thank you so much. Any um, additional comments? This is going to be our last question. Paula, any thoughts on this one? I do think um, using, you know, learn teacher learning communities to really think about what do we mean by the discussion, deliberation, how are you using it in your classroom, what's working, what's not. These are all what both of you were just sort of touching upon, but making the question of how can we, you know, learning to discuss is a skill that students need to learn. Just because we can make sentences doesn't mean we know how to have a discussion. So putting this problem in front of a social studies or science department, how can we improve discussion in the classroom would be one way that you could sort of open up everybody's opportunity to learn about, you know, different strategies that are working. But I think it, it does take, you know, you would want a whole department to be developing that skill from ninth grade to 12th grade. It's not a skill learned in one classroom. So can you design the whole department to be, um, you know, this is an area where we're gonna learn how to discuss. Um, and the science department can do it too. <laughs> I'll do, can you. I just say one last thought on the science to say to the science teacher, uh, not all of your students are gonna be scientists, but they are all going to be asked to vote on questions that relate to science. And so um, helping them understand what science is and how to think through it on public policy issues is really important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Paula McAvoy, Dr. Chrislyn Dengler, Lauren Clay Gildard, Amber Joseph, Dr. Oliver Robinson. Thank you so much. I'm Brett Levy and um, I'm really appreciative of all of you um, who have come to, to listen to this and participate and ask thoughtful questions and write interesting um, notes in the chat. So keep an eye out for a follow up a follow up email with resources and information about how to take action plus where to find recordings of these four webinars. This is the second of four. And next Thursday, uh, March 18th at four o'clock, there will be a session entitled Igniting Youth Civic Action, Making a Difference in and Out of School. And it will feature youth advocates. So I'm really looking forward to that and hope that many of you join us. So. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye for now. Take care.